So, in this film, I'm going to be talking about La La Land. I'm going to be exploring the whole idea of ideology. I'm thinking about various ideological approaches to the film and through the prism of these different viewpoints, how we might explore alternative ways of looking at the film. This, of course, is for EDGECAST Film Studies uh, A-Level Component 1. In the exam, we would be talking about La La Land alongside Captain Fantastic um, for the American Film Studies 2005 question. For the purposes of this video, I'm just going to concentrate on La La Land but obviously the theories that I'm talking about eventually we will be able to apply these to both of the films. And these are two questions that the exam board, obviously one of the things about this is a relatively new specification. Uh, we have only actually had one official exam paper, um, all the rest have been um, a specimen assessments. And this particular specimen assessment paper, we're going to focus on that question to one. How valuable has ideological analysis been in developing your understanding of the themes of your chosen films? First reaction to which is probably going to be OMG. But hopefully um, through this video I'm going to guide you through so that you'll have a bit more of a steer, a bit more of a clue on what to write for this. Now, first thing we need to think about, first thing we would need to do in answering this question is obviously show that we are fully um, on board with the concept of ideology. Ideology, remember, is all about the messages and values that underpin any text, the way in which it positions us as spectators, as members of an audience, to view the film. Essentially, you're asking, you know, what, what does this world, what does the world of this film value? What does it present to us as being of real significance? Here are some ideas that um, I stole um, straight from an EDUCAST document. So they've got to be reliable and trustworthy. Ideologies are a system of beliefs around the world. I'm going to try not to just spend this video um, reading PowerPoints at you, but um, apologies for every time I end up just reading PowerPoints at you. Ideology is often is linked to politics. There's no getting away from that. It's a left-right view of the world. Um, you know, which set of values does this film promote a left-wing way of looking at the world, or does it come from a right-wing perspective. Obviously, that's a very broad brush uh, approach, and we'll be thinking in a little bit more uh, specific uh, way than that. So, we need to think about what are the themes of this film, what potential approaches, ideological critical approaches, can we take in relation to La La Land? So I've narrowed this down for a few things that I've got to really uh, think about. Ambition um, is a key theme of this film, of course, for Seb and Mia. How far, how, what are they willing to sacrifice in order to achieve their dreams? Talking of dreams, LA, City of Dreams, home of the body bag, according to uh, gangster rapper uh, Pioneer Ice-T, but we'll, we'll leave them aside for now. Is LA a city of dreams or a city of nightmares? Um, link into ambition, link into LA, the whole idea of creativity versus commercial necessity, art versus commerce, one of the, the oldest binaries and dichotomies in the world. This is a film in which the pull of the past versus the demands of the now um, are very, very important. Plus, of course, the whole thorny issue of love in the modern age, which, of course, segues very much into a study and exploration of gender. So in order to think about these themes, we can think about different ideological perspectives. I think a good way of thinking about them, you know, Think of them as an Instagram filter, a way of just putting a filter over a picture. This is Marxism. This is feminism. This is postmodernism. And through each of those filters, how does that alter the way in which we see the film? We don't have to stick with one of those filters. With, uh, those filters, we can send them straight to trash if we choose. But we need to just place it there, place that screen in front of the film, and help us decide. What does that help us see in the film? What, how does that help us understand what is going on in this film? We're not compelled to go along with these ideological viewpoints, of course. As spectators, um, as active spectators, we are free to take whatever response we choose. Okay? Um, very important when we are writing about this film, this particular exam, 
when we're writing about ideology, when we're writing about theory, what educators don't want, um, and they're very, very explicit about this, they don't want you just memorising what each theory means and then just gobbing that all down, puking that all up onto the page. Undigested uh, definitions of theory are a definite no-no. Um, they want you to give the lightest touch to your definitions of theory. Everything should be in your application. Everything should be in your AO2 analysis. That is how you score big on this particular paper. Okay, So know your theories. Um, allow them to seep into the way you write about the film. But the focus has got to be on the elements of film, on cinematography, mise-en-scene, editing, sound, performance. That is where you are going to score. And it's by talking about specific scenes through those elements of film, but informed by ideological, critical perspectives. That is how you are going to score big on this particular question. Okay, So it's all about how the film presents its perspective to the audience okay and um, so we're going to start with the idea of postmodernism. this is Jean Baudrillard and um, he's a French philosopher so therefore it is impossible um, to find an image of, on Google of him not smoking a cigarette but like all French philosophers um, he came out of the womb popped out of the womb and just asked for a light uh, straight away in perfect French because he's a genius French philosopher um, Postmodernism has many, many strands. In terms of La La Land, the way of thinking about this is all of those many film references that are just scattered throughout the film. This is a film about film. It's a film in love with films. Many of those references are explicit, of course. It's Mia um, you know, showing Seb the window through which uh, Bogart looks in Casablanca. It's the cinema screen burning out um, as they watch Rebel Without a Cause and they can dash because they're in LA straight to the Griffiths Observatory. And they can visit the scene of that film. They're, when Mia walks across down the street, she is surrounded by a mural of images of stars from the past. The ghosts of Hollywood surround them. That's one aspect of postmodernism in this film. That's one aspect, one layer of film references. Another layer of film references is I'm going to see you, show you some images that I've um, you know very you know I have to come clean I've snipped from another video I'll put the uh, link to this down below um, so they get a bit of credit but there are lots and lots Chazelle has just lifted specific shots lifted moments sometimes you know shot for shot remake almost sometimes just the spirit of um, another film but they're there in his film. Postmodernism would state that everything has been done. There is nothing original left to us. All that we can do is, um, in the postmodern era, is just pick up the scraps of um, culture that has already been used and make something new out of the um, of what we find. That's very much, could be argued, what Chazelle is doing here. He's making a film out of, whether it's genre bits, whether it's um, out of references to other films. The postmodern ideological approach to this film could um, influence how we uh, as spectators watch this film. Does it mean that some people are going to watch this film just ticking off the references, congratulating themselves on you know, their deep knowledge of 1960s new wave French cinema as well as golden age of Hollywood musicals? Is that going to add to their pleasure? Is it going to subtract from the emotional impact of this film? Is um, Does your enjoyment of this film depend on your knowledge of cinema? Um, Chazelle, I'm sure, would argue definitely not, that this is a film that is meant to hit us in the gut. We're meant to, meant to have an emotional reaction to it. But a postmodern view of the film could instead focus on the intellectual, the cognitive response that we have to this film, the way in which we would study the film and think about all these many references that go past. So that could be one way in which we um, I can use a theory to view the film and perhaps as spectators view the film in different ways. Chazelle, I'm sure, would regard himself as a fan of cinema, someone in love with cinema. 
and hence the way he builds so many of these references into his uh, into his film. Gender, of course, is such a vital part of this film. It's a film that was argued about when uh, once critics had got over their initial raptures uh, of the, the first wave of uh, response to this film. The second wave was hang about. There's a few things that we need to think about here. Everybody just sort of got woke, if you like, um, to some of the, the issues underneath the surface in this film. And gender was very much, as well as race, which I'm going to come to in a moment, very much at the heart of that. So we've got to think, is this a film that privileges the male viewpoint, privileges male experience? We think about Laura Mulvey and the male gaze theory here. I think, you know, Seb mansplaining jazz to Mia. Um, think about Seb presenting himself as the saviour of her career. Think about all those scenes in which Mia um, and Stone's Law is just to watch Seb being a genius, being a male genius. Um, that's one way in which you can view the film. However, you're not compelled to, you're not obliged to. The other way in which you can see um, this film is very much a film that celebrates the act of spectatorship. Look at the, the joy with which um, Mia dances. Um, look at the way in which she throws herself in the jazz club around Sir Seb's music. She is not just bowing down, um, you, know, um, obs you know, showing uh, worshipping uh, Seb. She is a participant, and we are in an age of the active spectator. Um, so surely we must um, go along with the idea that she is not passive, she is active um, in her act of, of watching. There's also the fact that when um, Mia gains her success, she does so not through those auditions, through those sort of shoddy parts that she has to go for at the start of the film. She gets, um, she gets back through her own craft, her own ingenuity. She creates that play for herself. She makes her own opportunity. Um, and yes, she gives up and initially turns her, throws the towel in and it, it takes Seb to persuade her to return back to LA from Boulder City. But she wrote that play. And when she goes to that audition, she improvises. She isn't just reading out some, you know, another cliched uh, script. She invents on the spot and shows that she is a creative force in her own right. So again, gender, uh, a gender-based approach to the film would allow us to um, think about different potential reactions. This dude, um, Karl Marx, 1818 to 1883, obviously a seminal figure in uh, history, politics, philosophy, um, the whole works. Don't think he um, actually lived to see um, La La Land, of course. Um, but a Marxist approach to cinema would all focus on power structures. Um, Marxism is all about the oppression of the working class. You know, obviously one of his most famous quotes about religion, the opium of the masses. Well, cinema is another opium of the masses, another opiate to keep them narcoticized, keep them tranquilized. And of course, Hollywood is where those dreams, where that drug is manufactured. This is a film that celebrates and sells the whole idea of film as um, you know, as the dream of stardom, the lure of stardom. Um, so a Marxist approach to this film offers some really rich and interesting things um, to explore. There's the whole idea of art versus commerce, a strand that runs throughout this film. Think about the things that Seb has to go through, the compromises that he has to make. At the club, um, at the restaurant rather, early on in the film, when Mia first sees him and he's that struggle, does he stick to the scripts? Does he, um, you know, reel off those tired um, Christmas carols, those little ditties um, where he's, that his soul isn't in? Or does he give vent to his creativity? Does he allow his soul, um, you know, to pour out into Seb's theme? Then later, when she sees him at the party in his 80s garb, uh, you know, playing his guitar, the humiliation of being in that 80s tribute band, he has to make those sacrifices. Does art win out or does commerce win out? And of course, the biggest sacrifice he has to make, the biggest compromise when he joins Heat's band and you kind of feel his soul shrivel um, as he has to, you know, be take orders from that photographer about how he must look 
um, and you just know that this is him selling himself short. By the end of the film, of course, he has, you know, he's come through these, these series of compromises. He has achieved his goal, sacrificed his relationship with Mia, of course, but he's got his club. He's got success. He's got material success. He lives in a much, uh, you know, his shabby apartment of early in the film is long gone, and he's living in some chic modern place uh, now, still appears to be single, of course. So that's, um, you know, a really interesting way of thinking about the film. Another way, from a Marxist perspective, is the whole notion of LA itself. Um, la la land, la la meaning mad, meaning crazy, meaning eccentric, full of um, weirdos and misfits and eccentrics. Partly the film satirises that. Um, you, know, you think of the, the, the uh, world building script writer who um, you know, tries to chant Mia as part of the, the brutal nature of the auditions, the, the way in which at those auditions, you know, Mia is just confronted by the absolute indifference bordering on hostility of the casting agents. That's not a real celebration of Hollywood, but elsewhere in the film, we see, you know, shot after shot. It's about the aesthetic splendour of Hollywood. It's about, as I said, the ghosts that, that populate this, the, the spirit of the cinema, of cinema history that just fills, uh, fills the whole city. And ultimately, this film is something of a love letter to that. And it's a film factory with the emphasis on factory. Um, industrial processes um, are what Marxist theory is really interested in. Um, so that particular viewpoint is another really interesting approach to the film. This is Paul Gilroy. Um, Paul Gilroy is um, a post-colonial theorist. Um, and now, um, it could perhaps be seen as more of a media studies thing, um, but he, in relation to this particular film, again, there's some really rich ideas that we could explore based, if we come at this from the perspective of uh, informed by Gilroy's theories. So his idea is all about race. They're all about the way in which uh, black identity has been either erased or constructed as other. He's coming at things from post-colonial theory. Now, in um, the, po the colonial view of the world, it constructed things often into a binary, and us versus them. We were the civilised ones. They were the savages um, who lacked that sophistication and that civilization. Now, this is a film that could um, be seen, of course, to totally erase black experience. And in a film that is about jazz or half about jazz, you know, that was um, very much to the, the surprise and consternation of a lot of characters. Essentially, of course, we only have one black character and he's essentially the baddie. It's Keith, the main antagonist of the film, who, um, you know, the only black character doesn't understand jazz in the way that Seb does. Um, many critics believe that the way in which Seb kind of harps onto the past is something he's only allowed to do because he is white. If he really thought about the past, he would think about, you know, all the bad things that came with it, uh, that came with it, um, whether that be the, um, you know, we're obviously in a post-slavery world here, but whenever you dial back into the past, you're going into further brutality, you're going into further racism, um, you're going into further oppression of minorities. Um, and here he is, the saviour, the white saviour of jazz, and it doesn't get much more colonial than that in attitudes. So this is the essay that I'm going to want you to do. How valuable has ideological analysis been in developing your understandings of the themes of your chosen film, but in this case, just one chosen film, the one I've chosen, La La Land. Um, you can see here we've got um, the assessment objectives, or the mark scheme rather, AO2, AO1, um, both um, awarded equally. You can have a scan, you can press pause, and you can read over the indicative content. I'm not going to go at this um, for you here. But what I will do is just give you a little plan of how I'd ask you to approach this question. You obviously, any essay, you want to start by showing you understand what this question is about. And in this case, that means showing you understand what ideology is all about. Um, define ideology, show you understand that an ideology, ideological perspective can help you explore uh, films from different angles. 
give us that very brief, concise overview of the film, date, director, studio, genre, etc. You know, the stuff that you should be able to reel off uh, in your sleep. And then I would go theme by theme or um, ideological view by ideological view. Brief overview of the theory. Remember what I said, don't get bogged down in it. You're not just downloading and Wikipedia and, um, you know, a load of stuff about um, the theory. It's about your analysis. It's about focusing on key scenes from the film and exploring through close analysis how you could, um, you know, see that scene differently if you were thinking about it from a particular ideological um, ideological perspective and angle. Um, so postmodernism, Marxism, gender, and Gilroy's postcolonial theory would all be really valuable, um, useful theories to go at this from. Okay.